Views expressed by Camaplan podcast guests may not reflect those of Camaplan. Camaplan does not guarantee the accuracy of information provided by guests, nor does it endorse or recommend any individual or organization. Camaplan is not an investment advisor, CPA, realtor, or attorney. You are encouraged to conduct your own due diligence before making investment choices. For any tax, legal, accounting, investment, or other questions, please consult a specialist. Welcome back to The Road to Financial Freedom, where experts share stories and secrets to unlocking financial independence. This podcast is brought to you by Camaplan, a self-directed IRA administrator focusing on educating investors on how to grow retirement savings faster through alternative investments. I'm Ricky Trong, Camaplan team member and podcast host. In each episode, we're going to take an in-depth look at the many roads taken to financial freedom and how they differ for each guest. In 2002, it's been, I'm sorry, 2022 has been a year of ups and downs and we're only halfway through this ride. The housing market has been crazy for many investors and owners alike. Millennials are finally able to get into that housing game and they're finding their future homes. But what about the baby boomers? They're the ones that are going to be moving out of those single family homes. What do they do next? Well, that's going to depend on how their situation is, where we're going to be going from there, depending on their children and grandchildren's decisions sometimes. And today we have our guest, Isabel Guarino Smith, and she is going to be filling in those gaps for us. She's a residential assisted living academy COO. She is the leading lady for their team at RAL, also known as the Residential Living Academy. And she has been working in this position as COO for six years. She's been featured in magazines and articles regarding senior housing, and most recently was given the title and what I think is the coolest. The top influencer in senior housing. Hi, Isabel. How are you doing today? Welcome to the podcast. Doing so good. Thanks for having me. And that was a beautiful introduction. I that. <laughs> Thank you. We're trying something new. <laughs> I love it. Oh, man. So I'm really excited to be speaking with you today. We got connected via your team member, Katie Peterman, I believe is her last name. Peterman? Yeah. 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 And she's a rock star because she got us connected. And I think this is a perfect match. She's going to be, um, excuse me, Isabel is going to be leading off our podcast series for season two. So I think it's a great way to introduce our podcast again after our hiatus. And what a great guest to have on here. So happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So I would love you to tell a little bit about you. What is your background, what brings you into this um, residential assisted living housing game? Tell me about it. Yeah. So for me and my family, honestly, it started pretty close to home. My grandmother fell, broke her hip and, you know, the doctor called and basically said she needs 24 seven care. What are you guys going to do? And a lot of families deal with a situation just like this with their own loved ones. And it comes a time where you say, oh gosh, are we going to quit? Is someone going to quit their job and take care of grandma full time? Right. Or are we going to put her into a home? And as soon as you say it, you feel a little icky, right? It's like, <laughs> no, not, not beloved grandma in a home. Oh my gosh. Um, and you know, in home care is another option, but it's extremely expensive. So, you know, my grandmother was living in upstate New York. We were living in Arizona. And I think a lot of people think of Arizona and Florida kind of as like, oh, there's a lot of seniors, right? So we figured there's got to be better opportunity in Arizona. We have to be able to find something more suitable because there was really nothing we felt comfortable with in upstate New York for her. So we searched and searched and we found residential assisted living. And my dad being the real estate investor that he was, he ended up purchasing the home and the business right away instead of just getting, you know, my mom or my grandmother a bed in the home, right? He was like, no, let's go all in. Let's do this. And over the course of the next couple of years, I watched him go from being, you know, a landlord and overseeing all of these homes and being a little cranky, dealing with tenants and toilets and all the drama that comes with it <laughs> to being like this super lighthearted, loving guy. And every time he went to visit his home for grandmas, we were like, 
why are you like so happy? Like he was making better cash flow. He was so fulfilled. Um, and so slowly I was like, tell me more, tell me more. And I started visiting the homes and really getting involved and kind of growing into my role there. I ended up quitting my job as a flight attendant and joining my father full-time, uh, with the company. I was his first employee and we built the the team to over 50 people and built eight companies over the last couple of years. It's been a lot of fun. And my dad passed in October. So everything was kind of left and blessed to be left. I'm very thankful and grateful that he left everything to me. So now I'm the proud owner and operator of three residential assisted living care homes here in Arizona, as well as those other eight companies where we teach and train investors and entrepreneurs to do exactly what we do. Wow. Wow. So usually when like a parent that owns a business passes away, it's like a burden for the family. What, what like, how did it fall onto you? Like, did it feel like a burden? Did it feel, I know you said it felt like a blessing. Can you go into that a little bit more? Yeah, I always actually, I feel like that's kind of my mission right now is to encourage um, adults who have children to not just leave them trusts full of money, right? Money's cool, but making an impact is way cooler. I've had the such a blessed opportunity to have those three cash flowing businesses passed down to me where I'm making a massive impact on our community by providing really awesome jobs, helping families. Just yesterday, I got a call from one of my old bosses and she was telling me like, my sister, it's her brother's wife, you know, my sister needs assisted living. What do we do? And just the the pain and the drama and the guilt and the frustration and anger and all these emotions you feel in her voice. And to be able to be like, deep breath, it's okay. I've got you, you know, like I'll, I, I'll help guide you to the right place was so, it's like, this is why we do what we do to be able to help these families in times of need. But more importantly than that, if I can catch you before you need it and have you open your own home, now you can solve a problem for your own family. You know, my dad built these for his mom with the intention for him to move one day right into them. So we wouldn't have the burden of having to you know, figure out what to do when he needs it. He passed before he needed it, but my mom's still here and maybe she'll need it one day. So (laughs) I think it's a major blessing. And I'm super grateful that I was able to really learn the ins and outs of the business and work alongside with him, you know, over the last couple of years. So that way I, I did feel confident and comfortable being able to kind of take everything over and take the reins from there. Wow. Yeah. I mean, you just speak so passionately about what you do. And I know that you teach courses. Is that correct on how to own these facilities? Yep. Yep. So we teach investors, entrepreneurs, medical professionals, whoever you are who wants to get into this industry, how to own and operate or just invest in these type of homes. Oh, wow. That is really cool. I just... I never hear people speak so passionately about what they do. Like it's usually a dead end job or, you know, something they don't love. And you can like, we're on video right now for those of you listening on podcast, but I mean, her eyes just light up talking about this. It's so intriguing to me. Um, I know you had mentioned your father. That was Gene Quarino, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. And I heard that he's like an inspiration. So we had spoken about this, but the, um, principal at Camaplan, our CEO, he's actually taken one of the courses when your father was still teaching. And he just told us it was a cool experience, very enlightening. And I just, it's really interesting to see how someone can become so passionate about what they do. I mean, your father was passionate. He passed that down to you. It's awesome. Um, I was looking into you know, your courses and things like that. And what makes someone want to be in this realm? Like, is it specifically like your same story of grandma needs to find somewhere to go? We got to learn and we have to be that landlord. Almost like someone had spoken on a previous um, podcast you were on and said, it's almost like parents owning a college, like housing for their child to live in. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, tell me about, you know, what your what your clientele is like and how do they really get into get into that comfort zone especially if they don't come from like a like a medical background i guess yeah we are the people in our courses are there for all sorts of reasons right a lot of people 
don't think about this time of life until it does hit them in the face, right? Um, so there are many people in there who have their own stories, their own experiences of either currently dealing with this or dealing with it in the past or having fear of dealing with it very soon in the future, right? So that is definitely one category of someone who's interested in getting involved in this. A lot of other people are just there because the returns on their other single family investments are nowhere near as good. And maybe we met them at a real estate event or somewhere where, you know, our offering was way more attractive and competitive to be cash flowing $10,000 a month or more on one single family home when they might be using it as a rental, getting a couple hundred bucks a month. It's very attractive to them. So a lot of just real estate investors are honestly there mostly for the cash flow. And then I think like my dad experienced that fulfillment side, you don't get a lot of fulfillment out of being a landlord. Uh, you don't get a lot of fulfillment. Maybe you do out of doing fix and flips, right? You feel a little bit of joy once it's done and it's beautiful, but then it's over and you're out of the job. That's not cash flow. That's cash now. You know, you're still stuck in the rat race doing fix and flips. So real estate investors are really attracted to this. And then oftentimes we do see medical professionals who are really, really sad and burdened by what's happening in the larger facilities, in the hospitals, things of that nature. And they say like, I've got to help, you know, so many people go into a medical profession because they want to help people <laughs> and then they get in the environment and they're literally physically not able to do that because they're being so overworked or the way the systems are set up, it's pretty corrupt. So it's pretty fun and interesting to watch them, you know, try to come into our industry and basically say, I just want to help. Like, yeah, the cash flow is cool, but I'm making money of being a doctor over here. Or, you know, we have all sorts, anesthesiologists, dentists, whatever. It's wow. usually not about the money for them. It is way more about the impact. So we have all sorts of people in there. Our impact people, our, our at home people, our cash flow people, whoever you are, whatever attracts you to this, it doesn't really matter. Anyone can get into it. There's no, you know, restrictions on who you are to get involved. Wow. That's interesting. Okay. So you had mentioned something about people being worried about other types of facilities. So take me through what makes a residential assisted living facility versus, I believe you call them a big box facility. I think that's what we talked about in our last meeting. Tell me like why it would be more enticing for a family member to put grandma or grandpa into your type of housing. Yeah. So in a big box facility, right? That's what I, that's what I term like the Brookdale, the sunrise, the atrium. We've all seen them. We've all driven by them. They're the big boxes, right? Um, so those are typically, there's a couple things that are going on. Number one, the resident to caregiver ratio is significantly higher than it is in our homes. So over there, you might have one to 15, one to 25. At nighttime, I've seen up from one to 50. That's insane. One person cannot take care of 50 people. And that's where you hear the horror stories is that my mom, called her call button at 10 p.m. and someone didn't come until 2 a.m. It's not that caregiver's fault. It's it, it, it's the fault of the system being set up to say that that's OK. That's allowed. You know, it is what it is. We only have one person on tonight. That's not OK. In our homes, they're single family homes in residential setting, just like you or I live in. Right. So a, a normal neighborhood, per se, typically upscale, typically in a, in a luxury setting. Right. But usually a large property that's that's custom, you know, built and or retrofit for seniors. So our homes here in Arizona, they are 10 bedroom, 10 bath homes. I know that sounds very big, but they're only between 3,500 and 6,000 square feet. So it's not crazy, crazy big. It's just we've retrofit them to suit what we're looking for, right? They still have the shared kitchen, bedrooms, bathrooms, everything, the, the a little library and office. They still have everything that you need. It's a regular home, just instead of mom, dad, and two kids, it's 10 seniors. They have 24 seven care. The ratio is more like four to one or five to one at the max. So it's a lot better resident to ratio caregiver. 
The other big component or difference between a large facility and a residential assisted living facility is the cost of care. So the cost in a big box facility, they might lock you in at, let's say, $5,000 a month, right? The national average is $4,500 a month to have assisted living care. That's the national average. So every state varies up or down, right? So let's say you're you're at a big box facility and you've agreed to pay $5,000 for grandpa to live there. Well, Bat bathing day is on Tuesday and grandpa wanted to take his bath on Saturday. That's an extra $500 or breakfast was from seven to nine, but he wasn't hungry until 1030 extra $500. So that first month, even though you've signed up for $5,000 to pay for his all in care, the bill comes in, it's nine grand. And you're like, what the heck happened, grandpa? And he's like, I don't know. I'm just living my life. Like, it's not like they're telling him, right? They're just going to rack up the bill and send it to you at the end of the month. We hear this story time and time again. In our homes, it is truly that one flat rate and it includes whatever that senior wants, all their meals, whenever they want them, their, their you know, medications, their, their care, their love and care, going to the bathroom, showering, bathing, whatever they need, whenever they want it. If they don't want a bath on Tuesday, great. We'll give it to you when you want it, you know? So the care, the level, you know, of care and the price points are two major differences Another difference that's in favor of a big box would be the level of activities you can provide. So a lot of those you go and they've got pickleball courts, they've got movie theaters, dance theaters, gyms, right? When you're in a residential home, you're only able to have so many amenities. So a lot of our students like to build homes that have movie theaters, hair salons, and then like a nice feature in the backyard, whether that's a pool or a garden or walking paths, but we're not going to have all the same amenities that a big box will. So that is one difference that kind of leans their way. Something to remember is if it hurts to get out of bed and walk to the kitchen, you're probably not playing pickleball. So those features are really there to attract daughter Judy, the, the adult child paying for mom or dad's care. They're not for grandma or grandpa's use, right? It's really for daughter Judy to say, wow, I'd love to live here. This looks amazing. <laughs> and trust and believe it attracts her, right? But at the end of the day, when she finds out mom's never even stepped outside the door, let alone gone to the tennis court, it's like, okay, what am I paying for? You know? Wow. Okay. So take me through like how much it would be for someone to invest in this type of facility. Is it, you know, unreachable? Is it crowdfunded? How do they do this? Yeah. My answers are like very long winded today. I'm very sorry. <laughs> You're fine. I love it. I love it. I love Cut the info. Off if you want. You're so, great. Uh, okay. Um, the funding component. So there's kind of four different ways to get started and they're all going to range on how much you need or how to raise that capital. Okay. So first you could lease a home to do this. You could be partnering with someone who's going to retrofit the property and you're just going to lease the property from them. You don't even have to own it. So you just have to come up with that money for the lease and then probably two months of carrying costs while you're getting the business up and running. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also buy land and build a custom home from the ground up. We've got students in the Midwest who do this all the time. Obviously that's the cost of the land, the cost of the renovation. And then again, you're carrying costs to keep it, you know, running for a couple months until you're full. Second, you can buy a single family home and convert it to become an RAL. So that's, again, the cost of the real estate, how much renovation you actually need. You know, we're always going to advise don't buy like a thousand square foot home and you're going to be adding on four. Like that doesn't make sense. Start with something that's already as close to what you want it to be. So it's the most minor renovations possible. But you're not going to find a 10 bedroom, 10 bath anywhere. You know, you're going to have to do renovations, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but as, as close to it as possible. Right. Um, and then the other way that you could do get into this is buying the real estate and the business. Like I mentioned, my dad did when we first got in the game, that's one of the fastest quote unquote, easiest ways to get into this because, you know, you're up and running cash flowing day one, but the capital on that is obviously going to be a lot heavier because it's that business and the real estate purchase right 
right away. So it kind of ranges with each of the four categories and then depending on where you are in the country, right? We've seen people in for 300,000 and we've seen people in for 3 million. It completely ranges. Wow. But in our training, we always teach you don't use your own money, right? Like Robert <laughs> Kiyosaki always says like, you're being lazy if you use your own money, <laughs> other people's money. So you could definitely do syndications. You could do crowdfunding. I know with you guys and like the IRAs and everything like that, there's a lot of opportunities that you can invest. So I know that partnering, you know, with Camaplan and, and different companies like that, that can help you, you know, find creative ways to get that capital. It's a real benefit to you. And that's why I think it is such a perfect fit for us to be talking today because raising the capital for these projects, a lot of people don't, I don't want you to use your own money. We don't advise that. It's not what we do. It's not what our students do, but a lot of people that is their first concern is how am I going to come up with that money? And it's like, don't worry, deep breath. You don't have to, there's options and Canada plans got your back. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we totally do. And that is something that we definitely do. We find big syndications and we love having our investors invest into these syndications so that, you know, other terms would be a crowd funding for, you know, our younger folks on this. <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, hey, if anyone wants to, you know, give me some money, I can start this investment. We can go all in. I'm in. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, so you had mentioned four different like regions or I guess pricing tiers. Am I am I saying that correctly? Those four ways to get started kind of? Yeah. 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 Okay. So tell me about the four different ways that someone can get started. Um, I, you said there's a range from, you know, the 300,000 to the 3 million. What's it look like in between there? Yeah. So again, it's going to really range on your like state. And then of those four ways you could get started, what you're doing. So, so if you're like leasing the property and you just need carrying costs, that's very that's on your lowest end of how much capital you're going to need. If you're building land and going custom from the ground up, that's where our students get into the high millions, right? Because if you're building a custom, for example, Brad, our student out in Kansas, I want to say he spent at least 2 million on the land custom build for a 16 bed, 16 bath home out there. It is stunning. And he's wow. making a ton of money right now. But I mean, it, it cost him a bit up front. He's a general contractor um, by trade. So okay. he was like, this is right up my alley. I want to do this. I love to do this, you know? Um, so it just depends for us. Like I said, the first one, we purchased the real estate and the business. When you're purchasing the business, obviously there's many ways you can evaluate a business. This isn't like tech, right? Like the new TikTok where they're saying, oh, it's going to be worth 10x this one day. So we're going to pay $5 billion. Like, no, it's not that. It's more of like, it has to do with your, you know, your cap rates and your different percentages like that. And we kind of go through how to evaluate the businesses in our training so that our students know exactly what to look for and what to avoid. Like, uh, you know, where that's the, where that good range is, but it really, it really just depends on those four routes and then where in the country you are on how to kind of take that next step and, and what to do. But the, the most important thing is what we just said, you know, you don't have to use your own capital. So it's nothing to be afraid of because you're going to feel really confident and ready to move forward. You know, once you've learned all the information that you need. Yeah. Definitely. And I feel like having a teacher that's so passionate about what they do, it makes the student who is also the investor feel more comfortable and confident in what they're going to be getting into. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, we had mentioned earlier that your father had hired you as the first employee. Are you the only one in your family that does this or is it like a family affair? So over the course of the last couple of years, uh, we have had my sister, her husband, my youngest brother, my other brother, his wife, my brother-in-law currently works for us, his wife, my uncles, it's all sorts of family. My husband, my mother-in-law, my custom of my cousins. We've got plenty of non-family too, but lots of fam in the business. Um, and it's been super fun being able to work with them. I, it, it probably the best experience of my life, uh, honestly. Really? Yeah. I mean, I've seen certain, you know, I've seen other businesses where you get involved with family and or friends and it just isn't the best matchup. So I guess you're really lucky in the fact that everyone is working together. Do they all love it as much as you? Are they all as passionate? 
You know, what's interesting is I always tell people like, okay, so don't work with family or friends. Who does that leave? Enemies and strangers? Like, <laughs> I want to work with people I love. You know what I mean? I, I like have fun every day. I go to work because I want to talk to them, you know, and we'll talk work and then we'll talk life. And it's like, this is great because work is so much a part of our lives. So why wouldn't you want to combine them, you know, and why wouldn't you want to spend more time with the people you love the most? Now, I know not everyone has the best family <laughs> in the world, so it comes with a big asterisk on it, right? But no, I think that most of, you know, throughout the years, we've had family members come and we've had family members go. So not everyone is still in the business. This definitely, um, you know, over the years, you've got to really remember that, if you are going to work with family and friends, it's so important to have everything written down and contracts laid out because I always start that relationship by saying, Hey, I love you. And I want to work with you and I trust you, but I don't trust your spouse's lawyer because at the end of the day, when something happens, that's what it comes down to, right? Like I don't want things to go wrong. I don't want this to ruin our relationship going forward. So it's so important to have everything contracted, make sure everything's really clear and also continuously giving people an opportunity to outgrow you. You know, we, like I said, we've had family members here and when some of them are gone now and some of them have outgrown us or we outgrew them and having that really open, honest relationship to be able to say that I think is what can keep relationships strong and moving forward. Um, if you're not able to be honest with them normal, then you're not going to be able to be honest with them in business. So I think that's also something to remember before even considering getting into business with family. How <laughs> honest are you with them? <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so true. I love that. Um, speaking of family then, so what did grandma think? Like, had she ever been in one of those other types of facilities before you had brought her before you found the residential living and brought her in there because she lived in the one your dad owned, correct? She never made it. She passed before we we owned it. Oh but, no. I know, but um it all started because of her. And I feel like it's in a weird, in the weirdest way, like destiny. Like we wouldn't have been in this industry. We wouldn't have even known about it unless this happened to her. And it completely changed the trajectory of my entire family's lives. So in the strangest way, it's a massive blessing. Um, she passed before she could move in, but in the interim, we didn't have her in a home because we couldn't find anything that we felt suitable. We had her um, with in-home care, which in-home care obviously is where a caregiver comes to your home. And if you need 24 seven care, it's an, it, it, the rate is $27 an hour on average. So 27 times 24 times 30, that's 19 grand a month. It's insanely expensive. So when people say, oh, don't worry, mom, I'll never make you move and never make you leave your home. Yeah, right. You're really going to foot that bill. Like most people can't afford that, you know, on top of all of your life bills, right? Just shelling out an extra 20 K for your mom or dad to stay at their own home. So many people say, Oh, well, I don't need 24 seven. I'll take nights and weekends. And I just need someone to be there while I'm at work. Right. Well, if a senior needs 24 seven care, and you're going to be the caregiver on nights and weekends, say goodbye to church, wine club, book club, your kids, PTO meeting, like you don't have a life anymore because it's not like grandma, you can just pack her up, put her in the car and chuck her over to a soccer game every day. It's, it's painful. It's hard for them to get up and move and walk around. This isn't golden girls. This is like the last three years of their life, you know? So it's very different. So in-home care is usually very short-term temporary or people commit to, Hey, I'm going to be the nights and weekends uh, caregiver. And we're only going to have it during the day, which is still insanely expensive, you know? Yeah. You said $19,000 uh -huh. and that's a month. Is that correct? That's what uh -huh. you just said, right? Because uh -huh. I was too busy with my eyes bulging out of my head, like a cartoon character when you said it, that I couldn't comprehend the rest of what you were saying. That's insane. So then tell me about if in-home care is so much, how, how reasonable is what you do? Because I would equate that to be something similar, possibly in my own mind. I mean, I think it's as similar as you can get, right? Because 
Uh, in home care, you're obviously in your residential home, you've got one-on-one -on -one care. Residential assisted living is kind of that next step where it's like, yeah, you might have 10 other roomies, right? Living in the house. They're not in your bedroom. You still have your own private bedroom, private bath, but your care is four to one or five to one. So your care ratios obviously a little bit up and then you're still in a residential setting, but you do have other people living in the home. Then a big box is where you have, you know, usually 20 or more. It could be upwards of thousands in one facility, which feels a lot more hospital like uh not even apartment vibes because it's not individual like rooms a lot of time it's oh, or really? it is individual rooms it's more it's not like home it's just i don't know it feels very hospital like so residential assisted living and assisted living the average cost in the nation right now is forty five hundred dollars per month per resident so in the grand scheme of assisted living world that's very reasonable when you're comparing from in-home care you know or a big box facility which might upcharge you for other things so it totally ranges on your state i want to say dc is one of the highest rates right now wow. at like sixty nine hundred a month on average. Hmm. So um, that I have met quite a few people in DC who are paying for their parents 10k a month to live in an assisted living home. I mean, it's wow. wild. It's wild. So then when a Judy, as you call her daughter, Judy, <laughs> I love that. Um, <laughs> when you're trying to, when you're in the facility and you're trying to convince her to do assisted residential living, right? What is the enticement factor besides, you know, just the, you know, the beautiful home that they're going to be moving into? Is there certain amenities that you usually offer? Do you have a certain kind of staff? Is there a certain kind of care level that you handle? Yeah, most of the time, senior living is kind of like an avocado, right? It's too ripe. It's like perfect for like a day or two, and then it's gone bad, right? <laughs> so when someone needs assisted living, they're not touring being like, oh, I think my mom might need this in a couple of weeks or a couple of months. It is almost always she needs to move in now or like tomorrow. Like it's, it's they're touring and they are stressed to the max. And it's just like, okay, I'm seeing three or four properties. Which one is the best? Which one, you know, do I feel the most confident and comfortable in? So when you walk in to the home, that wow factor, not only with beautiful real estate and, you know, decorations and whatever, but the comforting factor, the fact that you're a home, you know, and you feel good and then being able to meet your managers and your caregivers, the different levels of licensing will range if you are going to be just a assisted living home or if you're going to offer memory care. So uh, having a memory care licensed home, which let's be real. I mean, I forget my keys every day. We're all dealing with some form of memory loss, right? Same. So, <laughs> so it's important that, you know, even if you're not licensed for it, you're going to be dealing with it at some way, shape or form, right? Because we're all having issues like that. But when you have a true um, home that's licensed for dementia or memory care, um, what you will need is a little bit of different requirements for the physicality of the home, different locks on the doors. You might have hmm. stairs in those homes versus our homes don't often have stairs. They're usually single level, or if they do have stairs, there's an elevator or a chairlift. In memory care homes, people are, who are moving in, not always, but traditionally people who are moving in, their bodies are with it. It's their minds that aren't anymore. So physically, they can move around. They can, usually the activities in those homes are much more active, right? They're actually doing dance class, not just like dance class, you know? So <laughs> if you're watching us on YouTube, you just got, <laughs> but, um, you know, they're having, they're able to do a lot more physical activities in those homes, but the leveling of licensure is a little bit higher. The cost to live in the home is a little bit higher, usually somewhere between $500 and $1,500 per month more per person if you need memory care and the level of the licensing of your caregivers is also higher. So you're paying them a little bit more because they've gone to more schooling or more training to get that level of licensing, just because there's different things you have to deal with and be aware of, right? It's a very different vibe in those homes than in a traditional assisted living home where it's a lot of physical um, issues. Like people are having trouble walking, bathing, you know, going to the bathroom, putting the spoon up to their mouth anymore. It's more 
more physical things that they can't live alone. They literally need help, you know, versus memory care. It's like they also can't live alone, but it's because they need that support, you know, to remember where they are, what's going on, who they are. Wow. Okay. That is interesting. I didn't realize there were so many different levels that could be within assisted living. Um, That's really, thank you for that. I appreciate that insight. Um, We had spoken, okay, I'm like spazzing out here. Sorry. You can cut that. Okay, Brian. Uh, (laughs) um, Let's see here. Um, I forget what we talked about last time. It was really intriguing Um, with like, your like investor. So the investor, like what kind of range can they expect to make from an investment like this? Is there, is there a possibility of, you know, something specific or does it range depending on the industry or the area that they're located in? Yeah, we kind of teach our investors to get involved one of three ways, right? So first is they could own the real estate and lease it to an operator. If they do this, then they should be making about twice the fair market rent because the person who's leasing the home from them, not only are they signing a longer term contract, not typically like a single family who wants to do a one or two year, right? They might be signing a three, five, eight, 10 year contract with the landlord, right? So it's a longer contract. They're paying you more. Why are they paying you more? Because you retrofit the home. It's ready to go for them. You did a lot of the labor and the hard work up front. You may have even got the license on the home. People will pay for that hard work that you've done too, to get the home, to have that stamp of approval from the state, right? So you've retrofitted, you've possibly got the license. They're willing to pay you more. They're willing to sign a longer contract and you might not be in charge of any of the maintenance, depending on how you set up that contract that could be fully on the operator. So one way an investor could get involved is to just own the real estate right? The other way is to just be a private lender or JV partner. So not even owning the real estate, not being an operator, literally just lending on this. Usually people are getting 12% plus a couple points when they're doing that on their money, you know, but it really ranges depending on the deal that you get involved with. At our convention, I was telling you about our RAL national convention that we host um, in the fall, there's a lot of people there who have a lot of capital who are basically walking around trying to network and find good deals to invest in. So if you are on the operator side or the investing side, that is a great kind of place to match make and meet people and network and see, you know, if you want to partner with someone there, because there's a lot of opportunity. The third way that investor could get involved is kind of what we do right now and what we mostly teach our students to do. So that's to own the real estate and operate the business. Now, we're not working in the homes and that's not what I advise you to do. But when I say operate the business, I mean from an owner's box perspective. So it's more of like hiring those people, setting up the policies and procedures, making sure things are running properly from more of a passive perspective. It's definitely an active investment in the beginning. You have to be way more hands on getting this up and running, but you can transition it to passive over the years. So in that scenario, if you have 10 residents at the $4,500 a month mark, right? That's $45,000 coming in every single month as your gross, right? 10 residents times 45, that's $45,000. Now your expenses, including your staff all in should be and food and uh, vacancies and miscellaneous and landscape and I mean everything, all your expenses for 10 bedroom home should range right around that $28,000 mark. And then let's say your lease, because in this scenario, you own the real estate and the business. So let's say your mortgage payment is right about $7,000 a month, because this is a home that has 10 people in it. So it's probably a bigger property, right? That's leaving you with $10,000 a month of net to you, right? That's your take home as the owner or $120,000 a year. So kind of three different ways to get involved, getting that twice the fair market rent on the lease, getting that 12% plus a couple points or that $10,000 a month of residual income coming in every single month. 
of course we teach you to do more than one because <laughs> you know, most people are like, I just need 10 K just every month, just like to pay the bills and survive and get by and have fun. But if you want more than that, it's like do two or three, we call it the three pack. We really encourage at least three because you can share your resources. You can share your staff. You can, if one home's full, you can have residents come to another home. It's a lot better idea to have kind of more than one because if you're going to do it, why not really do it? You know? Yeah, for sure. I was going to, you totally like touched on a topic and I was just about to think of the question in my head and you had almost answered it, but tell me a little bit about staffing for these kinds of facilities. I mean, especially if like for me, I'm not a medical background at all. I wouldn't know where to begin. How does someone, I, I'm sure you teach it in your course and we're getting a sneak peek of it here, but <laughs> tell me a little bit about how that works. Staffing. Yeah. So in the beginning, the main person you're going to want to focus on hiring is that licensed administrator. So they're licensed through the state. You can find them on regular job websites, Indeed, or whatever you like to use, right? Um, and they typically have experience in these. They're typically a caregiver who then went to school and kind of upgraded and trained up to become an administrator of the home. It's somewhat similar to a property manager, but they do have more of that medical background. So jobs that they might be in charge of hiring and firing your staff, doing payroll, do, figuring out who's coming for those shifts. They might be in charge of the grocery shopping, dealing with the handyman and the landscapers. They might be in charge of marketing or touring your facilities or welcoming the families, right? Welcoming a resident and dealing with the doctors and doing that level of care assessment. So there's a lot of different things that they might be in charge of. They're pretty much running the business for you. So you want to be besties with them. You want to make sure that you really really know, like, and trust them um, because they really are the heart and soul of your business. For us, none of the residents or the families in our homes know that I'm the owner. They haven't even met me or seen my face. They know the manager, the, the administrator. That's who they deal with and communicate with. I don't care if they don't know me. She is the face of the business. She's the one there every day. And I want them to rely on her and trust in her. So she, that person is going to be your key hire, your first hire and, and your most key crucial player. This other people that you're going to be hiring is obviously your caregivers. And again, you can rely heavily on your administrator to help you with this because they're going to be the ones kind of running that staff. The caregivers are really in charge of the day-to-day -day care of the residents. So whatever they need from, you know, bathing and getting up, helping take medications, whatever the senior needs, that is their primary focus. And obviously communicating with the families as needed to make sure that the resident has everything that they need and that they're really happy. In some homes, the caregivers are also in charge of cooking and cleaning. In other homes, you'll have a private chef. So in our, in our homes, remember I said the average rate's 4,500. We have some homes that are above average, right? Where most of our residents are paying six, $7,000 a month. In that home, there's a private chef because we can afford it, right? Hey. So you get three <laughs> beautiful meals a day, right? And the private chef's in charge of that. It also allows our caregivers to not have to worry and focus on that. They get to give extra care and love to the residents. When you have a home that's at that average rate or below average, you might not be able to afford extra amenities like that. So the caregivers might also be in charge of cooking and cleaning and things of that nature. Interesting. Well, I hope one day I get to be in one of those fancy facilities with a <laughs> chef. Hey, I mean, every meal. Oh, I know. gosh. I know. Nice. About it. 4,500 for fresh meals cooked by a chef, someone who will clean my room and do my laundry. I mean, I want to move in, right? Yeah, it right. Actually pretty good. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that sounds amazing. I would love to do that now. So <laughs> can you be any age to be in assisted living? Because I would love that. <laughs> I know. It's so funny. Most Mostly people are older, right? Your average, your average person is a female who's 85 years or older typically. Uh, but, you know, there's people who come in who are younger, maybe dealing with other issues who do need assisted living. You know, we had a guy who was like 45. He was wheelchair bound um, and, and he was was in there. He had, you know, some health issues and he needed it, but typically no, it's really for a lot of older residents who need that support and help. But I mean, I think it'd be a really fun concept. Maybe we could just make our own home where we all live. We pay a flat rate. We get a chef, we get a, a chef, you know, a cleaner <laughs> and we just make our own little pre golden girls home. <laughs> I love that. It'd be like Oprah, like having her private chef every day. Like 
I would be, I don't have to do Weight Watchers, you know? Hey. (laughs) (laughs) So that brings me to a question because I was intrigued. Is there like a, like a, a version for a special needs home or like kind of like a recovery home for people with drug addiction or anything like that? Would that fall in this realm of, assi- of assisted living as well that you have seen or that could be started? I don't know. It's similar, but different. So through the state, they're all considered group homes. We're just one of the categories of group homes, but we do have a ton of people who come to our training who ask about homes for developmentally disabled adults. There is a massive need in that, you know, realm of the world right now, because what happens if you have, let's just say an autistic child who's outlives you? right? And and who's going to take care of them? You took care of them their whole life. They're more than likely still living with you. It is terrifying for these parents of these children who have, you know, more needs than, than, you know, they're maybe able to take care of themselves. The government does pay a little bit of funding, just like they do for seniors, about $1,800 a month, I've been told. Um, but those homes really aren't giving them top quality care, food, love. It's really bad. And so unfortunately, we haven't cracked the code with developmentally disabled homes, but I am desperate to help these parents because it's so similar. I just need to find out how to make it make sense. Right now, it's it's the I can't figure out the financial component to make it make sense to anyone, right? Um, if we can crack that code, we can figure it out. So I'm I'm still mulling that one over when it comes to recovery homes or shared homes, right? For clean and sober, for maybe vets, maybe kids who were aged out of foster care. Mm -hmm. We've seen um, LGBTQIA plus homes, right, for kids who've been kicked out of their homes who need a place to live. There's absolutely a ton of opportunity in shared housing. In 2020, we launched a, a company, Recovery Housing Academy, which teaches and trains on exactly that because it is so similar. And because there's a lot of government funding, not a little, a lot. Oh. And especially the clean and sober recovery and justice involved uh, categories, um, the government will literally write you a check to house these different categories of people. So it's a lot easier to set those up and to get them running, but you have a lot more turnover and a lot more drama we learned over the last couple of years. So my heart is really focused on the senior category, but those are all different types of group homes. And we do teach and train on the recovery homes as well. Haven't cracked the code on developmentally disabled, but to come. And I will let you know when we do. (laughs) Yeah, please do. Because I actually, it hits home for me. I have an uncle with Down syndrome and he's lived with my grandparents my entire life and his entire life. And he is rounding 50. Um, That's not usual for Down syndrome, but he's rounding 50. And I know that my dad is set to take care of him once my grandmother passes. But I mean, she's also live in life. Like, I don't think she's going anytime soon. So, but I mean, it's, that's a worry, you know, that's a thought. So please yeah. let me know. Cause I'll, I'll be part, I'll be a first investor. I swear. <laughs> yeah. So you had mentioned that you have other companies. Okay. This is news to me. What, what else is, uh, you know, what else is around the corner or what else are you doing that you're keeping hush hush? Yeah. So we have the Residential Assisted Living Academy, which is what we've been mostly chatting about and focusing on today. Under kind of that umbrella of companies, we have the RAL National Convention, which I mentioned. There's over usually 600 to 800 people there and like 70 different vendors, 30 different speakers. This year, Tracy Tudor from Bravo's Million Dollar Listing Los Angeles is going to be there. Um, (laughs) Yeah, it's, it's a fun event and it's like kind of everyone who's in the industry or wanting to get into the industry, we love to invite them to come to that event because it's just a super fun place to network, honestly, party and just have fun and learn all about different tips and tricks to really being successful in the industry. Um, I heard some celebrities show up there too. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. we always have fun. (laughs) There's been so many great people in the past. Robert Kiyosaki likes to drop by. The most interesting man in the world from those Dos Equis commercials back in the day used to come. (laughs) Like all sorts of fun people. So um, it's a great event. 
Uh, we have the Ariel National Association, which is the only association for all of these smaller care home owners. There's about 30,000 of these homes across the country today, and there was no association to represent them. So we created that. We got legal backing and lobbying power for them, uh, lots of group discounts and different informational things for accrediting CEUs and different things of that nature. So the RAL National Association is a great uh, kind of source for people who are in this industry who need to be represented because when something comes across, you know, uh, the table of a state, the big box facilities have a lot more lobbying power and money to get things to be pushed their way. So when no one is standing up for the smaller homes and our voice in the industry, it's an issue. So we found that void in the market and just kind of jumped right in and said, nope, we're going to do this. We're going to help and we're going to be here. So we pat, we give out like legal updates on everything that's happening across the United States um, at all times on that uh, website so that people can just be in the know. And whenever there's like a petition or something to sign, we're always like, everybody, come on. <laughs> so that one's a fun one. Uh, we have Pitch Masters Academy, which teaches people how to pitch to raise capital um, and work with investors and syndicators and things of that nature, kind of the, the nuts to bolts of creating that business plan to like getting in front of those investors um, formally or informally. So that's a really cool um, program and training and company that we, that we have and know and love. Um, and I think that's rounding out my, my, my top five. <laughs> wow. You are a busy lady. That is for sure. And speaking of being busy, tell me about being the, t- one of the top influencers under 30, you know, in the senior housing community. I mean, that's just a big title. How do you live up to that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You know, they had reached out to us and it was really interesting because every year we attend um, all of the conventions that have anything to do with senior housing. And typically we're surrounded by the owners of the Brookdales and the Sunrises and they kind of look at us like "Mm, you're you're small peas over there. So to have them reach out and basically say we want to honor you and we want to give you this you know, title and award, I was like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. And it really just shows the trends in the market and kind of what's happening, what we're seeing. You know, when when COVID happened in 2020, people were ripping their parents out of big box facilities and begging to come into our homes because the level of care there was being exposed, right? People were seeing that there's tons of staff in and out and you can't control any disease coming in or out. Right. And so all of this happened and and senior housing got a really bad rap during that time, but we just started rising to the top during that time because all of the people were trying to come to our homes, realizing smaller is better, you know, and at the big conventions, the only topic that they all want to talk about now is how do we make our homes look and feel like yours? And it's like, you can't like you're, <laughs> I mean, you're trying, right. You'll see, you'll notice. And in, in, if you, if you look into this, people, uh, big facilities are now purchasing entire lots and building like mini neighborhoods now. And so they'll have like five or six in like a cul-de-sac and they're all residential homes, but technically they're all run by the one conglomerate. Mm-hmm. So they're trying to do like what we do. Um, it's just very different, right? It's still, uh, the ones I've been in still don't feel as homey as, as ours do. Um, but it's really crazy. So I think that that award happened honestly because of COVID and because of the exposure to what we're doing and everyone saying there has to be another alternative. It's kind of like everyone's sick of taxis. Where's the Uber? That's what we're trying to do saying we're new. You might not know us. You might not feel comfortable yet, but as soon as you get inside that first Uber, you're going to be like, never again will I get a taxi. (laughs) Wow. That's like a great analogy. I love that. Cause like I was always sketchy about getting into the Uber originally because taxi was everywhere, you know, like, wow. Wow. And to be so successful through COVID where so many businesses were just closing their doors. That's absolutely incredible what you did. I love that. 
Yeah, it, it was strangely enough. I know many businesses sadly went out of business and a lot of businesses, I mean, we're here on Zoom right now, they're booming, right? They're doing better than ever. So um, it just happened to be, we'd been preaching the message for a long time and it finally kind of caught wind and then it really turned in our favor. And a lot of different press articles, news articles came out really just saying that same thing that People don't want these big facilities anymore. They want something small, intimate, that feels very homey. And it was pointing exactly to us, which is, I mean, better than we could have ever asked for. Hey, you got that big neon flashing sign. That's perfect. (laughs) Who doesn't want that for marketing purposes, you know? (laughs) Yep. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So we had mentioned like baby boomers, right? These are your ideal market that you're accommodating. So what is going on with, my God, why am I losing my train of thought? (laughs) It's one of those days. Um, What is going on with like the housing market for them? So how does someone, forget that. (laughs) What, how does someone pay for something like this uh, when you are a senior? Is it coming from them? Is it coming from outside funds? Is, uh, you know, insurance paying for it? Tell me about that. Yeah. So funding for the homes comes from a couple different ways, right? If the senior served in a time of war, they might have VA benefits, which is an awesome opportunity to help them pay for it. Some seniors do rely on Medicare, Medicaid. Like I said, it usually will be able to support about $1,800 a month for the senior. So it's not much, but it it does help some seniors. Um, Some people have saved up, the baby boomers have saved up a lot of cash, right? They might have their IRA investments or they're planning to sell their homes, right? Mm -hmm. Like you mentioned at the beginning of this, to pay for their needs, right? So a lot of people think that this greatest transfer transfer of wealth from the baby boomers to the millennials, uh uh-uh, honey, you're forgetting (laughs) about assisted living. It's going to go to pay for their time of need. The cost of assisted living has gone up 79% over the last 10 years. And if you look, uh, genworth.com forward slash cost of care, tells you how much assisted living will cost in your area. And the coolest part is there's a little toggle that you can say, well, how much will it cost in 10 years, right? Like my mom doesn't need it now, but maybe in 20 years, maybe in 10 years, it is skyrocketing because the demand is completely not being met with the supply. And as we all know, economics, like that's a case of a crisis right there, right in front of us. Currently, the silent generation is who's in assisted living. But the baby boomers, there's 76 million of them, and they will need a lot of care and homes to live in. So this is a major opportunity. That transfer of wealth is going from the baby boomers to the assisted living, and whatever is left over will get passed back to down generations. But if I have any say in it, I'm going to take both pieces of the pie instead of just one, right? And you guys could too. It's it's definitely up to you, a crisis or an opportunity, however you want to see it. Wow. Yeah, because I remember when we spoke, you were talking about um, the need for the assisted living facilities. I mean, I, I remember you mentioned 1.3 million beds are short. And is that over the next 20 years or is that right now? No, that is by 2025. So in, oh. the, in the next three years, we're, we are 1.3 million beds short for the need. And then at the peak, uh, so in I want to say in like 15 or 20 years at the peak when baby, because baby boomers aren't in assisted living yet. Right. Right. They're, they're still thriving. My, my mom's a baby boomer. She's doing great. (laughs) Living her best life. Um, But no, but they don't need it yet. But when they do at the peak, there will be 11,500 people turning 85 every single day. Um, That's crazy. Like this is, the fastest growing demographic on our planet, the 85 and up group. We've never had this many seniors alive at one time ever. And the important thing to remember is it's not like it's this big balloon. It's not like the baby boomers come and then no need for assisted living. So all those homes are going to shut down. No, hello. Almost every baby boomer had kids. And so the, if you look at demographics, our, our world used to look more like a triangle and now it looks like a rectangle because there's just more people alive than ever before. So the baby boomers, yeah, but they had kids and those kids had kids. And so it kept growing and growing. It's more rectangular. Now there's just more millions of people alive. So it's not something that 
dies off after the baby boomers are not, no longer with us, it's something that's going to keep going. Like we're going to need this one day, right? Unless we're getting care in the metaverse. I don't think anything's going to be changing anytime soon. So, <laughs> Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's really interesting. Cause I was thinking about that the other day, like, just like there's so many baby boomers coming into this. Cause that was such a huge generational boom. That's why they were named that generation. And I mean, all of them. I feel like during that time, they all had multiple children. It wasn't just one, you know, one child. So, yeah. wow, it's the need for it. it's insane. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I, so, so that means that this business is not going to be going away. It's something that's almost generational. It can help build like generational wealth for a 100%. family that owns it, huh? One hundred percent. I mean, if you think just of my family story, which is so similar to so many people, you know, we needed it for my grandmother. I will keep it right now and be cash flowing until my mother needs it. And then one day I will be able to live in it and pass to my children a cash flowing asset that they can one day live in and their kids can one day live in. I mean, truly every family should just have one of these, if anything, just to be <laughs> your, you know, retirement plan. I mean, I have so many friends who, whenever we talk about like, oh, you know, our parents or what's going on. All of them say, can my parents come live in your home? Can my parents come live in your home? And it's like, you should get your own. Like, come on, I'll teach you how to do it. But, you know, to each their own, they can all come live in my home. Cause this is the thing. We're all going to get involved in senior housing one way or another. You're either writing the check to somebody else lying in the bed, or you could be cashing the checks and living there for free. It's up to you. I love that. I mean, it must make you feel great though. And everyone's like, your facilities are so amazing. I want my family to live there. Okay. So <laughs> that's a huge yeah. compliment. I would take it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Oh man, that's amazing. And so then we've already touched on generational wealth and how it's affected your family in such a positive way. What? How does that equate to financial freedom for you? Yeah. So being able to, you know, all three of these homes that my dad passed me basically are cash flowing $10,000 a month or more, you know, on their own. And so being past that is absolutely like a, a, a dream. And that's why I say it was such a blessing that my father left these to me and not a burden at all, because I already knew kind of what to do. Right. And it was just put it into action and keep them going in the way that I've been trained to do this. So um, financial freedom is so important. And especially with our world getting really crazy, you know, inflation, recession, gas prices, politics, everything is super wild out there right now, right? It's the wild, wild west outside. And I think it's more important than ever for people to really be thinking about all of those things, right? Generational wealth. How are they going to have enough money to survive up times and down times? Like this isn't something that you should, it's, it's just like a one time make some money. This is cash flow for the rest of your life. Residual checks coming in every single month, you set it up, you get it running, and then you can kind of run this more passively. And that to me is the best type of financial freedom where I can sit here and be with you and not not mind or know or care what's happening because I know it's being taken care of to the utmost quality. And getting that check every month, I mean, nothing is more freeing than that. Wow. I love that. You have a positive outlook on life. And I really appreciate that because there's so many people that are just so dark and gloomy about what they have to say. And I just see it, how much you care. I really enjoy that. And um there was a question that I had and now it's blanking on me, of course, uh, just because everything you say is so intriguing. <laughs> no, um, but yeah, so we had mentioned the um, conference. Is there any promotions or any interesting things that you have going on that you want to talk about before we you know, start wrapping up here today? Yeah, so the REL National Convention is coming up September 29th through October 1st. It's in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, and I believe we have a fun little discount code there with your QR code. So be sure to check that guys out. 
um, and use the comma plan promo code so that you guys can get $100 off your tickets and come to the event. It's super fun. Honestly, it's a great place just to kind of jump in, get your feet wet, and honestly, talk to our past students and really meet a ton of people in the industry to see if this is something you really do want to get involved in and invested with. And like I mentioned, you might be meeting a lot of investors, so always put your best foot forward. <laughs> yeah, and they should probably take that class on how to talk to investors and really invest. That's your other course that you, you sponsor, right? Or it's under your umbrella of companies. Yep. yep. Pitch Masters Academy is a great training to kind of learn all of those different steps to, you know, get in front of investors and know what to say, what not to say, how to attract them in the right way. And that's an awesome opportunity to go from there. I think we also added my dad's free book. So yes. My dad wrote a book just before he passed and we have it available to you guys for free for listening in today. Um, I think it's free book paid ship. So use that QR code, go ahead and download it, learn more. Um, yeah, I, I, I love to share any, any, any info that we can. So happy to I be. I love that. I love that. Free info is always great info. And it also gives you like your feet wet into the, you know, making that decision. If you really want to get into that next step of learning about the process and really getting involved. So I love that you're giving us those free opportunities and that great discount. That's amazing. Everyone can check out the QR code. You can scan it right on YouTube. The links will be also in the show notes and, um, as well as the links below in YouTube. So if you can't scan the QR code, we got you. No worries. Um, and then Isabel, like, is there anything else that you wanted to touch on today that you think is important for our audience to know about you, your companies, your lifestyle, whatever you want? Tell me something fun. Yeah. So I'm, I've had a lot of fun sharing with you guys today. This has been a really awesome episode and I love that we kept it Oh no, we froze. Oh, can you see we me? Froze. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, so thank you so much for having me. It's been really fun to be here with you. And um, I've, I've just had fun having a great conversation with you, being able to chat about everything. I know if anybody wants to learn more just about the training, about everything that we offer, ral101.com is a great source to go to free, you know, webinars and free information. And we can also have uh, a chat there. There's an opportunity for you to schedule a discovery call. So if you want to chat with me or anyone on our team about your next steps, I know that this is a pretty different investment than you might be used to hearing about. So I'm excited to be able to kind of just expose you to this. And if this is ringing any, you know, bells for you and you're like, man, uh, the cash flow sounds good. The impact that you can have on your community sounds good. And maybe your family needs this or might need it in the future. The time is never better than right now. So I hope to see many of you at the convention and possibly talk to some of you guys at RAL101.com. Yeah, I love that. And I definitely want to know, I am myself want to take this course and learn more about it because I know we spoke about this before, but my husband and I are just getting into the investment realm of things. Um, we owned a home and we started renting it out. And that's so far our financial freedom journey, but I would love to expand that. And I definitely want to look into your course. I hope I can come to that national convention because that sounds like so much fun. Um, I just want to say thank you again to you and your whole team at the Residential Assisted Living Academy for getting us you know, set up. And I really enjoyed speaking with you. And again, I just want to thank our our sponsor, Cama Plan, as well as our production team, Honeycomb Productions. Thank you so much. And please follow the QR code if you're on YouTube. Otherwise, check the links below. And everyone have a wonderful day.